Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. So as I'm sure you're aware, there is another movie coming out soon in the Jurassic franchise, Jurassic World Dominion. And apparently this is the last film in the franchise. I'm a little skeptical about that. We'll see if that ends up being the case, but that's what they're saying. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to take a look and a listen back to the original Jurassic Park and the iconic sound design that went into that film. So I invited the man himself, the sound designer and re-recording mixer of the film, Gary Rydstrom, to come onto the Dolby podcast today and join us to talk about his work in Jurassic Park. Uh, if you know anything about movie sound, you certainly do not need me to introduce Gary Rydstrom to you. But uh, just to take a little tour through his many accolades over his career, uh, Gary Rydstrom has been nominated for the Academy Award for Sound 20 times, most recently, just a few months ago, for his work on Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. He has won seven Academy Awards for sound in film. Uh, and in, in fact, won two of them for Jurassic Park for best sound editing and best sound mixing. So uh, this is uh, just truly one of the great uh, film sound pieces that is out there. It really changed the game for creature sound design. And, uh, and it really had a big impact on Gary's career, which we'll talk about. Um, in addition to his Academy Awards, uh, Gary, I'm just going to look over here at my cheat sheet. He has been nominated for the BAFTA five times and won twice. He uh, has won more Golden Reel and CAS awards uh, and gotten nominations there than I can even start to enumerate. Uh, but I will say that he won the Career Achievement Award from both the Cinema Audio Society and the Motion Picture Sound Editors. So he is truly, uh, you know, uh, a, a legendary figure in the sound uh, film community. And uh, I, I will say, uh, if you know anything about me, uh, I spent a decade as the head of studio at Skywalker Sound, and that's when I really got to know Gary. Uh, and in addition to being an extraordinary artist uh, and a true kind gentleman, just a great guy to work with, uh, he also became a friend. And so it's always a pleasure to sit down and talk with Gary Rydstrom uh, as I've gotten to do several times on this podcast. So I'm thrilled to be in conversation, just the two of us, taking a listen and a look back at Jurassic Park. I started off by asking him when he started working on the movie, uh, almost 30 years ago now, if he had any idea that he was laying the foundational uh, sound design work for what would become a huge franchise, and also really, as I said, a game changer in the world of film sound in terms of creature sound design. I, I don't think I would think that, that I was going to create a foundation. In, in fact, I have to say, I, I drew on creature work that Ben Burt and, you know, Murray Spivak and people like that did in movies before me. So it kind of, it's a linear thing. But I knew the moment I started working on this movie, come on, it's a great idea. A, it was a fun book. Steven Spielberg, it turned out to be revolutionary for computer animation, computer effects. And it was... The, as, as safe a bet as you could imagine for a movie. Yeah, I think you're right. I was, I've, I've been thinking about this uh, for the last few days because I knew we would sit down and talk. And it, I, I remember, you know, because uh, I was kind of early in my career when, when the, yeah. but I remember this was the first time I was ever aware of this. When the book was published, Michael Crichton's novel, it was already part of like the marketing campaign for the book that Steven Spielberg had bought the rights and this movie was coming. And so it was like, right. it was this kind of juggernaut. Like, I don't remember ever a movie being more highly anticipated than Jurassic Park when it showed up in the summer of 93. Yeah. And, and one thing I forgot to mention, dinosaurs, come on, you know, <laughs> you know? so yeah, everything kind of lined up and uh, you know, it was great for me because it was er relatively early in my career too, and to get a chance to do this kind of movie that was as guaranteed a movie could be to be um revolutionary and fun and big. That was, uh, I was, I, I enjoyed every minute of it. For sure. So I, how did you get involved in the film? So you had been the re-recording mixer on always. So you, you, you'd kind of established a relationship with Spielberg that way, but this was obviously a big step up in terms of you becoming the sound designer and, and the re-recording mixer on the film. Well, to be honest, I think 
uh, one of the main reasons I got the gig was that Ben Burt was busy doing something else. <laughs> so, I mean, I'd, I'd worked on Spielberg films, but Ben, Ben was always in charge and he wasn't always and, and uh, Temple of Doom and, and uh, Last Crusade and those movies. Um, so he was unavailable and I had, and in 91, I, I won an Oscar for Terminator 2. So kind of uh, put a little asterisk next to my name, like, oh, kid has Oscar. So, right. you know, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I mean, like a lot of my early career was, uh, I, I depended on Ben not being available. Well, you know, you, you were following in some legendary footsteps. Tell me about your reaction to... Um, I mean, you kind of touched on this, the excitement of it, but like wh when you, f when you first read the script or that first conversation with Steven, uh, tell me about like uh, how you approach the project and kind of what that first impression was. The script, it, it got, it was pretty exciting. It, right from the get go, I knew there was going to be pretty fun for sound, you know, and, and I think the hardest, but the most fun thing to do in sound design is creature vocals. So that, you know, the first thing I do is start to record sounds and, and, and think about that kind of stuff. The script was cool. The book was cool. But the coolest thing was they did some previs. We call previs now, but then it was kind of, they had little puppets. Uh, um, Phil Tippett, who was on the show, did kind of an, you know, stop motion animated previs scenes of two major scenes, the main road attack with the T-Rex and the Drex, uh, the Raptors in the kitchen. And so before they shot anything, I had these scenes, you know, kind of shot by shot, you know, with a stop motion dinosaur, uh, uh, animatronic you know, puppets that's that Phil made uh -huh. and little cute little kids it, before they even cast the movie. So, you know, the, the main characters didn't look anything like Sam Neill or, or sure. the kids. And so I got that to play with. So right off from the beginning, I could take these previous scenes and I could th throw sounds at them and send them to Spielberg to get reaction, which was, which was great. So, um, you know, I was, uh, uh, from the, from that moment on, it was, uh, it was, I knew that this was going to be a, a special kind of sound project. You bring up the, the, the creature vocals, the dinosaur vocals, obviously any conversation with you about Jurassic Park, that's the main topic to discuss, which was how did you approach, um, you know, the assignment of creating these vocals. Now, obviously this was a landmark film, as you point out, because it was really the first major use of CGI, uh, but, you know, it's at least it, it still hasn't to this day it really worked to, to take a computer generated sound approach. So how did you kind of start to tackle this assignment of like dinosaurs? What do they sound like? How am I going to create all this material? Yeah, I think I mean, I have a theory that especially in the early days of computer graphics, sound needed to be real even more so. I mean, I, I, I like real sounds. You know, synthesized sounds are hard to do. Not so interesting, usually. Um, so I knew it needed to be real. But in this case, it has to ground visuals that you just can't believe, right? So the sound had to be organic and real. So the first thing I did is record as many animals as I could. I, I, and I did talk to scientists. Useless, a waste of time. Because every scientist I talked to, every paleontologist, every dinosaur expert said, well, I don't know what they sound like. There was one guy who studied the, uh, the crested dinosaurs, and he made a, a long, essentially one of those long tubes that you blow through until you made that sound. That was the extent of my research. So I did have a question here. Did, did, was any of your sound design rooted in scientific reality? So I will we'll just cross that off because it, apparently, apparently that was a useless. <laughs> I tried. I tried. I, I, I did try talking to scientists about that. I think I've in the years since I've read a lot about scientists learning more about what the vocal box or equivalent would be in dinosaurs. And everything I read says the sounds of Jurassic Park are completely wrong. So, um, oh, well, sorry. Uh, you know, and it's a movie. So I, I took kind of the movie approach versus the, uh, the, the scientific approach. Um, but I did do research. I'm proud that I read one book about animal communication. And I learned some things about what makes an animal seem like a predator versus a uh, you know, a victim or a, you know, benign, you know, when they communicate with each other, meant as communication, meant as a scary sound, meant as, uh, um, you know, what, what, what represents kind of, uh, uh, you know, like a lion roar has got this wide pink noise range of, <sighs> and then happy animals that, you know, have a kind of a pure sound like birds and, and animals that make, and dogs that make kind of a, a pure sound. So, Things like the brachiosaurs make the singing-like, pure tone kind of sounds, which are 
pleasant and the T-Rex goes. <laughs> so I, I, I try to do a little bit of my research that way. Yeah. So of course I have to ask you, what are, what are some of the components that, that go into some of these sounds? Like uh, maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can dissect the T-Rex roar for a second. You can tell me how, how that was derived. Well, I, I, it's something I learned from Ben Burt and watching him work. He, he used to work with a four track tape recorder and then layer sounds, you know, through two, three, four sounds and layer them into something new. So I, my approach to almost all the main dinosaur sounds was to find elements that I could layer. So the T-Rex roar is really layered like a, like an orchestration thing. So it hits different frequencies. So the low frequencies are, there's a lot of alligators uh, down there. There's uh, lions and stuff in the mid range, elephants down in the low range and the high range. I mean, the secret to the T-Rex, which I've talked about many times because it's a cute story for a scary sound was this cute baby elephant. We recorded big elephants to try to get big sounds. And then they brought out this little baby elephant and, and then they said, Oh, he doesn't make any sound. We'll not, you know, we'll bring him out anyway. And he made this screech, this shriek that became the high element of pretty much every time a T-Rex screams in Jurassic Park to this day. And there's this one little cute, you just want to hug baby elephant that made this, this sound that we captured, just got it. And then, Tried to get it to do it again. Never did it again. It was kind of a one-off, weird, perfect sound that was uh, became the identifiable element in the high frequency for the T Rex. What was the biggest uh, the biggest problem for you to solve in 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 the creation of the sound for the film? The raptors had to sound like they were smart. Right. Um, T Rex could sound like it. It smells you. It sees you move. It eats you. That's pretty much. That's the extent of the thinking process for a T-Rex. The raptors had to sound like they were calling to each other, kind of thinking. So the, you know, the T-Rex attack is just brutal, big monster coming for you. The raptors in the kitchen is kind of a stalking. Right. And they, they're, and they they're, call to each other. They, they communicate call. with each other. Right. Right. So, and that's an idea that's carried through into the Jurassic world, you know, ideas so that the raptors are intelligent and they communicate. So trying to find animal sounds um, that seem like calls to each other, kind of thinking. There is a little guttural click that I really like for the raptors, which is the one sound not made by an animal. I had a friend of mine, uh, his name is Dietrich, who made this kind of sound with his voice. And it, you know, the raptors actually do this kind of, to me it felt like um, just kind of a thinking sound. And then when they bark at each other, that... Uh, you know, there, there was a tortoise sound in there and some other animals. So the raptors are made up of the biggest variety of animals. So it's not just finding one animal and it's the raptor. The raptors are, God, must be 20 you know, horses and, 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 and uh, African cranes and dolphin screeches for the high element of the scream. Same idea for the raptor scream for the T-Rex. So the attack scream's got the high frequency, which is a, a, a boy dolphin recorded underwater screaming added to a walrus for weight, right? So you get that, which is really kind of scary. Um, but there must be, a, but horse breathing and, 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 um, and, you know, goose hissing and, and, uh, and then my friend Dietrich, and then you make this vocabulary and you try to put it all together to make it a believable thing. So the range of the Raptor had to be the biggest range because it was the smartest of the dinosaurs. So you, obviously you were doing this work at Skywalker sound up at the, up at the ranch. And what was the technology at the time in terms of, uh, were you working digitally? Uh, uh, kind of where where were we in the in the evolution of of sound editing and and sound design and moving to digital platforms at this point? Digital editing for sound hadn't quite happened yet, so we were still cutting on mag. You know, the film was being cut on film, and we were mixing on mag and mixing on analog, you know, uh, consoles. No real automation to speak of. Um, but the one digital thing I used, uh, I had this Sinclair, which was a a digital sampler used for music. Michael Jackson was using it at the time. Uh, Frank Zappa was a big Sinclair user. And um, you could take real recordings, sample it into this keyboard computer, and then play them on a keyboard. I could do in the Sinclair, it had four levels that you could layer things, just like the Ben Burt method on a four-track tape recorder. I could do it on a Sinclair by taking four sounds, layering them sort of, pitching them so they kind of blend into each other. And then I could play them on the keyboard. I ended up having a lot of patches, they called them. So I had a T-Rex patch and I could perform 
T-Rexes, basically. And so a lot of my cutting for the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park was watching the movie with keyboard in front of me and then having breathing and screaming and that kind of stuff and kind of playing it like music. The Sinclair obviously must have changed the way you work pretty radically because you were able to hear multiple sounds at the same time and manipulate them in real time. Yeah. And if you cut on mag, I mean, th at that time, you cut on mag, you, you hear one sound at a time. There's no way to hear multiple things. So the dinosaurs are both created and cut on the Sinclair because it's a sequencer as well. So you can actually kind of, you know, perform to the, to the film. So yeah, it gave me, it gave me, it was kind of the leading edge of what became digital cutting. Yeah. One of the things that struck me again, because uh, I knew we were going to talk, so I, I, I watched the film again for the first time. Still I mean, holds up, doesn't it? Still holds it really, up. It really does. And I got a good I, movie. Well, it, it is a good movie. Um, and uh, the, one of the things that struck me again is just is how differentiated the dinosaur species are. They really sound completely different from each other. That must have been a fun kind of challenge for you to sort of get mood and tone differentiating depending on what the dinosaurs are, are doing. Yeah, and I tried to think in terms of personality. So I gave each one, you know, the brachiosaurs have kind of a soulful, long phrase, singing personality. The spitter, I love the spitter because it's a split personality. So it has kind of the uh, hissy rattlesnake, um, gaspy attack sound, but it's got cute sound, which is actually a swan, a lot of swan recordings. Uh, the raptors are, are a huge variety of, the gallimimus was actually made from, horses that were uh, a female horse that I would bring a male horse nearby and the female horse would go, eh, that was the Gallimimus. Um, so it really, it came down to recording and Chris Boys, who's a, a great sound designer uh, in his own right, was my key recordist for a lot of these things. We gathered so much material. Then it's a matter of putting this wide range of material into vocabularies and trying to make each of the Dinosaur is distinct, as you say, so they have a personality. Um, I don't envy the Al Nelson and the people who have taken the, the more recent Jurassic films because they have even more dinosaurs. And I think I ran out, you know, I got after four, five, six dinosaurs. Well, that's as many as I got. So take it away, Al. Um, yeah, but you're, make, you're right. It's, it's a key thing is to make them different. And I, the key word is personality. Right, right, right. I, I want to take a, a, a minute and kind of focus on the major set piece of the film, which I feel is the 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 T Rex attack on the road. Um, it occurs. Uh, I was I was interested, kind of looking more structurally. It occurs ex almost exactly at the midway point of the film. It's basically exactly one hour in. This sequence happens, and I was really stunned taking a look at it. You know, from the time that they they lose power and the cars stop until through the end of that sequence, it's 10 minutes. It's a, it's the biggest scene, the longest scene by far in the film and there's no music. So I, I what a gift to you as a sound designer, like I'm handing like from Spielberg, like I'm handing you the centerpiece of this film. There's no music and it's all on you, buddy. So talk to me about how you constructed the sound design. I'm sure that, you know, th there's like the challenge of making the T-Rex roars and everything, but you've, you've also got to think about this entire scene and how do I build and maintain this tension? Steven Spielberg is very smart at, at planning how the movie will work. A lot of directors would have put at least temp score over that scene just to keep it interesting early on in the cut. But he knew right away, I think, that that scene had to be without music. He and John Williams. What makes the scene work too, filmmaking, the anticipation for that, you, you think you're going to see the T-Rex earlier and you think you're going to see it again. And that's a sucker punch and you don't see the T-Rex. I say, oh, okay. Um, and now you kind of know it's coming and there's a, there's a long lead up to the, to the main road attack, which has great John Williams score to it. Kind of a, just a tension score that builds up and then stops. If you think about the main road attack, what makes it scary is that we're stuck. It's raining. You're on vehicles that have no power and there's a stasis to it. So you're sitting ducks and you know, there's a T-Rex out there and now you have no way to get out and you're, you're stuck in a car. So it's kind of built into the scene and what, and the rain was a great element. Also wish it was my idea, but it wasn't because the sound of rain on, on windshields and all that kind of stuff, there's something kind of unnerving about that. Uh, and plus there's a detail to that. That's really great. So the lead up to the T-Rex is full of little details, little, you know, rain on, I did rain on hat, rain on and glass, rain on pavement, rain on everything. Right? And my favorite little tiny details when the T-Rex, you hear the boom, again, a genius 
way to introduce the dinosaur from uh, Spielberg's idea. You introduce it with sound, not visuals. So you hear the boom of the distant footstep, and there's not only the ripple in the cup, but the mirror in the in the in the car that the kids are in rattles. It's just the tiniest little sound. So contrast, contrast is great. Contrast is how you make something big seem big. You have quiet surrounding it. So the scene is built to have quiet, which doesn't just mean the lack of sound, but detailed sounds you would only hear if it's really quiet. And when the T-Rex shows up, it's like, oh my God, this is, you know, now it's, it's um, you know, feels bigger than it would have because we had this long lead up to it with tiny detailed sounds. That's a great, I, I, that's a great way to put it. And you even, you even modulate that internally in the sequence. I watching it again. I was really, you know, so you're in the middle of the attack, the T-Rex is attacking the car and then you cut to, you know, Sam Neill and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and Jeff Gold, Goldblum and, and the Goldberg. other car watching this happen. Right. And, and Jeff Goldblum at one point like reaches up and, and wipes off the, you know, tries to clear the fog off the windshield and the sound of him doing that is so clear and pristine. So like you carve out these quiet moments, even in the middle of this, like, it's just a great exercise in modulation. I have to say, it's also ILM, the Dennis Muren team and, and Phil Tippett and those guys, they didn't do what sometimes people do with creatures, which you have the creature and it just does this all the time. <laughs> so the T-Rex had a, a range. I, a lot of this Phil Tippett, because Phil Tippett thinks in terms of animal behavior and things. So the T-Rex isn't just balls up <laughs> attack, right? It was it's kind of thinking, it's looking around, it's sniffing, it's taking its time. And then when it roars, it means something because it's not been roaring the whole time. When it first shows up, it comes through the, the fence, the electric fence. And it's not, it doesn't roar until it makes it through. Then it roars. And you go, oh, this is great. So that dynamic is built into the animation of the of the T-Rex from the get-go. And just again, you were talking about how it holds up. Like just the kids, you know, that those shots of the kids when the T Rex, you know, when the T-Rex head comes into the car and is pushing the you know, the the yeah. glass roof down on them and they're holding it. It's terrifying. It's still terrifying. Oh, it holds up. I have to, you know, and, and um great use of of combination of Stan Winston doing the, you know, a practical T-Rex on the set and then the, the ILM CG dinosaur. And it's still, it's still a great scene. It, uh, that's one of those scenes that I will always be grateful that I, I got to do sound for. Yeah. Uh, and, and I love the, the, the dynamic range and the way you use silence uh, or quiet moments in the film. You were talking about that a little bit earlier, but it, it happens again towards the, I had forgotten that the Raptors in the kitchen really happens like in the last, 10 or 12 minutes of the film. It's really kind of the, that's, that's, that's where everything, all the pieces come together, but yeah. that's preceded by the kids. Like they're in they're they're, you know, eating these desserts like crazy. Finally, we feel like, you know, things are safe, <laughs> you know, you know, they're in this safe space, they're eating dessert. But the interesting thing is like the music leaves mm -hmm. the, you know, and it becomes a very quiet moment. And you actually, it's, this is something that you do so well. You actually use, quiet and silence in a way that makes you incredibly tense because you know something bad is about to happen if right. it's getting this quiet right and then, you know think about it. the mu music is a key part of this movie but when it goes away it kind of drops you into reality I and mean, you kind of feel like you're there with the characters and that moment also is a moment of false moment of safety and rest the kids are enjoying the food right and the the tiny sound there kind of like the tiny sound of the mirror before the t-rex shows up the tiny sound there is jello so they're about to eat jello and they, you know, they, they hear, they actually see the shadow of a raptor and you hear the jiggle. <laughs> I'm sure it was the Foley crew that, you know, I don't think I did that sound, but just that little <laughs> jello sound. But I love that kind of thing. You know, I, those kind of little sounds followed by big sounds. The other little sound that I love is makes me laugh every time is when the lawyer tries to hide from the T-Rex in the outhouse uh, in, in the main road attack. And there's a little latch as he try he latches the door as if, you know, that's going to keep the T-Rex out. <laughs> so you hear this little ting and then you delay the, you know, the attack of the T-Rex. So you have time for the little ting and then bam, dynamics, man. Love it. And so many great moments. Like I, I love that, that, you know, th that sequence builds and builds and builds from a sound perspective as well as the, as the Raptors are stalking them, even really, you know, before they come into the kitchen, there's that shot that just, I feel like Spielberg handed you so many great, you know, just softballs for you to knock out of the park. That sequence, you know, the the raptor head comes in and we see it through the porthole glass and he, mm -hmm. you know, 
breeze and the glass fogs up. Like what a great, very specific moment for you to have a lot of fun with. Yeah. And that's, that's just a horse breath. I remember recording horses and just get really close to the horse. And like, sadly, what makes animal sound recordings really good sometimes if the animal doesn't like you. So if you put the microphone in the horse, the horse goes, <laughs> and that, that's the sound of the fogging the glass in the kitchen. Well, that's fantastic. What can you tell us about the, uh, putting that, that sequence together, the, the raptor attack in the kitchen? That's uh, such an iconic scene. Yeah. I mean, but it's, it's, it's got quiet in it, as you say. It's got a nice build to it, and it's it's a it's a sneaking around. Um, and there's two raptors, so you can hear hear them on either side of, of the kitchen. So that's that dynamic is is great. But you know, it also involves a lot of what I think is the key sound for any creature, which is breathing. I think breathing is sometimes underrepresented as a as, a, as an element for personality. So a lot of the breathing in that is is the raptor just kind of breathing and then stopping and they're hunting, right? So they're hot stopping to sniff and try to find you. So the scariness of that scene is not out and out screams, which happen. It's the, you know, they're smelling for you and listening for you. So you have, you can't make a sound and you can't, you just, you just hope they don't smell you. Genius visual in that scene, all the reflections in the stainless steel. So I'm sure ILM and Dennis Mirren went, what are you thinking? We can't, we have to do the dinosaurs and we have to do the reflections. But it, it made this house of mirrors uh, quality to the scene, which is great. There's no place to really hide. So it's a stalking scene. It was very, very different than the T-Rex attack, which is just, you know, a tax scene. This is a thoughtful stalking scene. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, you know, I was thinking about this too. I mean, has there ever been a filmmaker who had a year like Steven Spielberg had in 1993? He has, you know, he releases Jurassic Park in June and then in December he releases Schindler's List. Uh, just a, a, an amazing kind of one-two punch of like popular summertime, big popcorn movie, and then thoughtful, you know, adult film in the, in the same year. And I just, I, I know from conversations that we've had previously that you guys were in post on Jurassic while that was happening. Steven was in Poland shooting uh, Schindler's list. So I know that that complicated the post-production on the film. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about how you guys were able to pull that off and sort of uh, what a, what a, it must have been very strange for Steven to like come off the set and of Schindler's List and, and take a take a listen to Jurassic Park. Uh, well, for, for you're right, ninety three, pretty good year for Steven. It shows range. I think those two movies definitely define range. Um, and us, we you know we didn't have the the benefit of having Steven on the stage with us when we final mix. I did had sort of previewed so much sound for him before he went off to Schindler's List that he knew what he was getting. But yeah, you're right. When we find Gary Summers and I and, uh, and Sean Murphy mixed at Skywalker and then twice we flew to Paris. I joke that, you know, it's sort of we, we met halfway for Stephen. He flew from Warsaw to Paris and we flew from San Francisco to Paris. So, <laughs> uh, but he's, well, he is the he, director. He, um, but I, I think he saw it as it was fun to see his reaction to the Jurassic film because I think for him it was cathartic. He must have been in a very intense place shooting Schindler's and they flew over he and Michael Kahn and uh, his group from, uh, from Schindler's. We went to a studio in uh, outside of Paris and we played him the movie. And I remember the first time he saw the main road attack, he literally jumped on his chair. He just was so, he, he maintains an enthusiasm for film and for filmmaking that I, I admire. And uh, he enjoyed those moments. I think they were, I'm, I would imagine that they were, um, beneficial for his, uh, how he was feeling in Schindler's List was such a relief for him. But still, we got two intense times in Paris. We got notes. He had a, a recorder, a dictaphone, and he would, he, would, he would record his notes as the movie was going by. And when it ran out of tape, remember tape? We don't have that anymore. Tape, you go click, he'd hand it like this, and his assistant would put another tape in it and he'd keep talking. <laughs> so, and then Gary Summers and I, on the, on the flight home, we'd listen to the listen to the tape and write down all of his notes. So it was an intense way to get notes from him, but it was also um, joyful because he uh, enjoyed the experience so much and, and was so enthused by how the movie was coming along and how the sound was coming along. What has been the impact of Jurassic Park on your career? 
I, you know, it's nice. You know, Ben Burt has lots of iconic sounds, and you say, "Oh, Ben Burt did the lightsaber. Ben Burt did Chewbacca, right?" So he's got more than anybody. It's, you hear his sound, you go. And I, you know, Terminator Two, I've done some. I'd already done some pretty iconic movies, but nothing in in my sound career, nothing as iconic as as the T Rex or the dinosaurs in in Jurassic Park. They just, you know, the combination of how they looked, the movie, how the movie worked, the sound of it makes. You can't plan for an iconic sound. You can't say, well, today I think, oh, it's on my list, uh, iconic sound. Um, it, it depends on all the things coming together. So, you know, it's, it's, it's my chance to do what Ben did so many times over, which is to make a recognizable sound that if you put it in any other movie, people say, wait a second, that's the Raptor, you know? Um, so, yeah, that was my, that's, that's the effect it had on my sound career. That's great. So you're listed as the consulting sound designer on the new film, Jurassic World Dominion. What did you bring to the table and what was it like uh, to kind of come back and, and dive back into Jurassic? I've been a consultant on all the Jurassic Worlds, mostly you know with Al Nelson and Pete Horner and the people who've taken over, to start by giving ideas about how to approach making dinosaur vocals, because it's you know I have an idea how that, how that best works. And as I said, I think I've kind of run out of ideas. So those guys are free to <laughs> come up with something different. Uh, the latest one, I had fun, partly because we were in pandemic world, uh, quarantine world, and I was sitting at home. So I made more dinosaur sounds than I've made in a while and gave them to Al and Pete and said, hey, use them if you want. It's kind of a fun excuse because the, the most exciting thing about doing a Jurassic movie is new dinosaurs. Oh, this one is new. There's something new about this dinosaur in Jurassic World Dominion's got some pretty interesting new based on real dinosaurs dinosaurs that provided some opportunities for a new twist on sound that we haven't done before that's great well i'm looking forward to it i can't wait to see the film yeah it's amazing gary thanks so much for uh taking the time today to look back with us on jurassic park and talk about what uh, you know this just is one of my favorite movies yeah mine too thank you very much it's fun to talk about thank you once again to gary for taking the time to sit down and talk with us about the work on Jurassic Park. And thanks again to uh, also to our friends at Lucasfilm who uh, put this conversation together for us. Before you go, please make sure that you are subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We have some big stuff coming up soon that you're gonna be interested in hearing about, including something we're working on, uh, uh, a, deep, a deeper dive on the new film coming out soon, Jurassic World Dominion, that you will not wanna miss. So you can find us wherever you get your podcasts via the links in our show notes or simply by searching for Dolby in your favorite podcast app. Until then, thanks again for joining us. This has been Sound and Image Lab brought to you by the Dolby Institute. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.